Welcome, everyone, to the Howard A. Schneiderman uh, Bioethics Lecture for a spring of, nine, of 2019. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> 1920-13, okay. Uh, I'm Al Bennett, the slightly confused, uh, Hannah and Francisco Ayala, Dean of the School of Biological Sciences. Uh, this series began in 1990 with a very generous gift from uh, uh, Howard Schneiderman, who was the former Dean of the School of Biological Sciences, the Dean who was in place when I was hired, so he didn't do everything right. Uh, but for the past uh, 23 years, the series has brought to UCI uh, outstanding faculty uh, uh, and uh, to speak about important social and ethical issues that have uh, surrounding the advances in both biology and medicine. Our lectures are always open to faculty, staff, students, and our many community friends, and we're glad that you could join us this evening. And I'm very pleased to recognize our good friend, uh, Audrey Schneiderman. Uh, Audrey, where are you? Where? Okay, way up on top. Thank you, Audrey. I'd like to thank Audrey for her continuing support of uh, both UCI and the School of Biological Sciences for these many years. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Our speaker this evening is Dr. A <clears throat> Dr. Ethan uh, Nadelman. And he's the founder and executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance, which is a leading organization uh, in this country for advocating for drug policies that are grounded in science, uh, compassion, uh, health, and human rights. Dr. Nadelman received his BA, JD, and PhD from Harvard, as well as the Masters of Science from the Internet and International Relations from the London School of Economics. He subsequently taught politics and public affairs at Princeton from 1987 to 1994. He's authored two books on international criminal law enforcement, Cops Across Borders, and Policing the Globe. He's also the author of many dozens of articles on drug policy. He's described by Rolling Stone as the point man for drug policy reform efforts. Uh, and he's widely regarded as the outstanding proponent of drug policy reform, both in the United States and abroad. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Dr. Ethan Nadelman. Well, thank you very much. I, I must admit I was intrigued when I got an invitation to speak at a bioethics distinguished lectureship. Um, so and I was thinking, so is there any way I should make my talk here different because it's this? And I said, well, I guess maybe it means talking a little bit more about the ethical aspects of the work that I do. And of, but it, you know, in, in my own personal evolution from academic to activist uh, and thinking what does it mean to uh, promote science promote scientific results in the public policy world? What does it mean that when one's promoting not just scientific conclusions, but also ethical values? What does it mean to put out there all the arguments that your opponents would make against what we're trying to do? And to put those things out there in a way where then my opponents can say, well, even Ethan Edelman says, or admits, or what have you, right? But I think that's actually part of the obligation, the professional and moral obligation of being an effective advocate for changes in our public laws and public policies. Um, you know, I've oftentimes, this, this is actually, I've been told, not actually, you're not act usually at the University of California at Irvine right here. You know this? You're actually in a building of the National Academies of Sciences. And I've oftentimes described the Drug Policy Alliance, my organization, as the principal organization advocating for the policy conclusions and recommendations on drug policy of the National Academies of Science. The reports on marijuana in the 80s, on uh, HIV and needle exchange, on drug treatment, on methadone, the whole range of things. I mean, that, that's really a good part about what we're advocating for. Science will take you up to a point about what we need to do, but then at some point, you hit a level of reform that involves a measure of risks uh, where value judgments have to be made. How far do we take this? How far do we talk about legalizing this drug or that? And those are things where actually science can't fully tell you what the answers are going to be. Science is a very good uh, predictor 
of what the results will be of incremental changes in policy, and that's most of the work that we do. But when you get into the bolder, the, the bolder reforms, the more far-reaching reforms, the more revolutionary reforms, then in fact science can help but fall short. And that's where our sets of ethical values and our understandings of human nature in the context of various societies really come to bear. Now, I was thinking about, to start on the more academic or to start on the more political movement element. I thought I'll start on the more political movement one, which is just to be forthright about this, because you know people oftentimes ask the question, who is this drug policy alliance? Who is this drug policy reform movement? Who are these guys advocating you? And, you know, and their response oftentimes is to say, you know, I know who those guys are. Those are just the people who want to get high. They just want to smoke their weed, maybe use their psychedelics. That's what it's all about. We know who you are. And my response to them is, there's some truth to that. <laughs> um, because the fact of the matter is, there are millions, tens of millions of us Americans and around the world who actually do just want to smoke our occasional marijuana, or maybe not so occasional marijuana, and who have found those psychedelics awfully interesting and beneficial, and uh, like our vision questing on those things. And, and maybe we dabble in the other substances as well, and we're responsible drug users, and in fact, that the, in our own personal lives for millions or 10 millions of us, the bottom line is drugs been good to us. You know, I mean, you know, look at my, my personal life with marijuana psychedelics, net plus, no question about it. And I know that what's true is true for millions and tens of millions of other people, right? Even those who today deny it because maybe they're sitting in the White House or something like that. But I mean, that's, that, that is a view. And I basically fundamentally believe morally and politically that it is none of the government's business what I put in my body if I don't hurt another soul, if I don't get behind the wheel of a car. Leave me the hell alone. Right? That is a moral view. It's a moral view about personal freedom in the context of a complex democratic society. Right? And I, I will also say to my employer, what I did over the weekend ain't your damn business. Right? If I did drug X, Y, or Z on a Friday night and I show up you know, so, so, sober on Monday morning, none of your business. And you don't take my urine. My urine is my urine. It's not your urine. And you don't get to look inside that. So yes, it really is about us potheads, us stoners saying, get out of my face and stop treating me as a criminal. But you know what? That's not all we are. That's not the entire drug policy reform movement. Because you know who else we are? We're the people who hate drugs. We're the people who have seen the worst that drugs can do. We're the ones who grew up cleaning up the puke of our alcoholic parents. We're the ones whose brother is living with hep C because he was shooting drugs, and another one who lost a kid to an overdose because of from using heroin or some pharmaceuticals. We're the ones who have addictions and addiction genes running rampant through multiple generations of our family, who can't conceive of what it means to be a responsible consumer of alcohol because we take one drink and that's it. We are down that way. We don't know. We truly do wish that we could live in a drug-free society, right? We believe in the gateway theory of drugs that use pot goes well because that has been our experience. If we could wish it that there would be no more drugs, we would wish it. But you know what? We know that no matter how much we wish it, it will not come true. And no matter how much we wish it, we live in a society and we'll always live in a society of high levels of drug availability. And we know that the war on drugs is no way to deal with the horrifying realities of drug addiction in our society today. That there is no legitimate basis for saying, you, you are addicted to your alcohol or cigarettes, you go over there, forget the criminal justice system, and you're addicted to this cocaine, marijuana, heroin, methamphetamine, you go over there, you deal first and foremost with the criminal justice system. There is no basis in science, in ethics, in medicine, even the Bible, for making that sort of distinction. And that's why we believe in drug policy reform, even though we hate drugs. And you know who else we are? We're also the people who don't give a damn about drugs and who don't particularly see ourselves as drug users. I mean, our kid may be on Ritalin, our spouse is on Prozac, grandpa's popping Viagra, you know, we have a glass of wine in the evening, cup of coffee in the morning, da -da, but we don't see ourselves as drug users. 
right? And we're not really interested in drugs per se. But you know what we are interested in? We're interested in preserving the values of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution in American society in the face of drug war hysteria. We're interested in not wreaking havoc throughout the Caribbean and Latin America and Central America and Africa and Asia and letting narcos take over countries because of this thing or eradicating drug plants with chemicals that we don't know what the long-term consequences are. Or maybe we're people who just deep down believe about freedom. And we believe in peoples who are libertarians who believe the government should not be involved in this at all. And we're civil libertarians who believe in our basic fundamental freedom. Or maybe we're people who can't stand the outright racism and racial injustice and racial disproportionately of the war on drugs, of looking at who's in our prisons, of seeing that black, black Americans represent 12% of this population, but 50% of the people behind bars. And that black people who may use drugs at no higher rates than white people, but nonetheless are getting arrested and incarcerated at dramatically higher times rates. We're the people who believe about a whole set of other values, about medicine being allowed to practice and physicians being allowed to practice without having the cops looking over their shoulders. So who are we, the Drug Policy Alliance, this growing drug policy reform movement? We're the people who love drugs. We're the people who hate drugs and we're the people who don't give a damn about drugs. But every one of us believe the war on drugs is not the way to deal with this reality in our society. That's who we are. And that's what it means to build a political movement built around a common set of values that says that drug policy should be rioted in science, compassion, health, and human rights. That's what it means. That's what it means to take people who have struggled with drugs and enjoy drugs and not care about it and to build them. It means to take people from the left, the right, and center who agree on only one thing, which is the war on drugs, is not the way to deal with this reality, right? Now, what does that mean concretely? And how do we get from where we've been to where we need to get? And what does where we need to get look like? That's what I want to spend the rest of this time talking about and sharing with you. Because I think the way to think about this, to be more analytical about this, is to ask what should be the objective of an optimal drug control policy? Right? And I think one way to frame it is to say the best drug control policy seeks to do two things. Number one, it seeks to reduce the harms of psychoactive drugs. It seeks to reduce the harms of addiction and disease and criminality and the destruction of families and communities that inevitably happen because all drugs we know, any drug can be used safely and any drug can be used in a destructive way, in a way that causes harm to one's own body, one's own life, and to the people around you as well through your, own, through your behavior, right? So one way to think about it is we want to reduce the harms of drugs and we want to reduce the harms of the government's policies, of the government's prohibitionist policies. We want to reduce the crime, the violence, the corruption, the black markets, the violation of civil liberties, all the waste of money, I mean, all, the, all of the bigotry and the stigma and all of the stuff that goes with that, right? And that the optimal drug control policy is the one which most effectively accomplishes that balance of reducing the harms of drugs and the harms of the government policies. More recently, I find myself presenting it in another way. It is of envisioning the range of drug policy options as arrayed along a spectrum, right? So imagine at one end over here, we have the most punitive drug control policies imaginable, right? The, the Saudi Arabia, Singapore, chop off your fingers, pull out your fingernails, pull anybody off the streets, drug test them, throw them into a quasi-drug treatment camp that's really more like a prison. You know, zero tolerance taken to the absolute extreme. And then we think about reducing the, the harshness of prohibitions and moving down this way. And at the other end, over here, we get to the free market, right? The free market drug control policy, no controls except maybe limiting access to kids. Um, uh, Milton Friedman's wet dream, right, for, you know, MFWD over here, right? And that bit, think about American tobacco policy in the 1960s, right, essentially no controls. And then the challenge becomes, so where on this spectrum, right, is the optimal point, and how do we get there, right? Now, the mission, I would say, the objective, if I had to define drug policy reform in one long sentence, it would be this. It would be, we seek to reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system 
in drug control to the maximum extent consistent with protecting public safety and health. We seek to reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system in drug control to the maximum extent consistent with protecting public safety and health. That means moving things down this spectrum, right? And if you think about it, it means slowly rolling back those mandatory minimum sentences, rolling back those three strikes laws, as you guys just voted to do last year. Right? It means ending that criminalization of drug possession where, people, where people's only offenses to possess a drug get thrown in jail or prison. Right? It means moving into this camp, I mean, from away from Saudi and Singapore into parts of like the US over here, and, and depending upon where you are. And then, and then it means coming over more and more over to the leading countries in Western Europe, which really are much more committed to a model of, um, of treating addiction as a health issue, of not making a priority of arresting people whose only offense is using a drug, who don't believe in locking up people, you know, people who sell drugs to other adults and locking them up for like, like they're rapists and murderers, moving down this way. Now, if you start over here, the other way to think about drug control policy, like with cigarettes or alcohol, is how do we increase, not criminal prohibitions, but how do we increase the regulations, the taxations. Look what we've done with cigarettes, right? Cigarettes, smoked in the form of tobacco, perhaps the most addictive substance known in human society, right? Well, increasing taxation, putting time and place restrictions on use, all sorts of campaigns to uh, restrict access to discourage people from using, right? We know that even though cigarettes are the most addictive drug out there, we know that what, what, roughly half of all people who were habituated smokers are now no longer smokers, even though we know, you know, how do you know an ex-smoker? You don't really know an ex-smoker until the day they're on their deathbed. They go, oh my God, I didn't smoke for the last 30 years, right? Because you never know when somebody might relapse. But that idea of increasing the restrictions. Well, back when I, in my academic days, before I was so directly involved in advocacy in the, in the early 90s, I was teaching at Princeton, and I put together this working group of 18 distinguished academics from about a dozen disciplines, right? All of them, all of them uh, hostile to the drug war. None of them pure libertarians who believed in getting rid of everything, right? And, and all of them have been writing and thinking about drug policy for a long time, and we tried to think through what would be the optimal drug policy, the one that most effectively reduces the harms of drugs and the harms of prohibition. Right? And so we engaged in this intellectual exercise. And part of what it was was trying to stretch. So it was like trying to decriminalize from the prohibitionist model as much as possible, stretching over here. And on the other side, to increase the time and place restrictions as much as possible without actually getting to the point of prohibition. Without getting to the point of a prohibition that would actually create the whole new black market, black market you know, production, all that sort of thing. Right? And what happened was we stretched here we stretched here. We couldn't quite get it there. And we then took a vote among these 18 distinguished academics who had collectively been working on drug, and drug issues for like 400 years or something like this. And we decided to come up with a model. In other words, with, with, you know, what would be the optimal legalization model? Right? And if you think about it, what lies in this middle is ultimately the question of the gatekeeper. Who is the gatekeeper between you, the adult resident citizen, and the supplier, right? The, the supplier of the drugs, the pharmaceutical company, the, the, the pharmacist, right? Who is it? Is it going to be a, a doctor? Is it going to be a physician? Is it going to be a pharmacist? Right? Who, is it going to be a religious leader? I mean, who, who's going to be the, the gatekeeper there, right? And so we, we got to the, and at one point, we, we came up with a model, and, right? And we had a vote, and the group was evenly split. And then we argued all day long. And at the end of the day, the group was still evenly split, but half the people had switched sides. <laughs> and what that told me was that in struggling with this issue of what's the optimal solution, right? There were people, it was so hard to conceive, to imagine, what's the model? Can we use the alcohol model for dealing with cocaine? Right? Can we use the tobacco we're using with heroin? I mean, is that right? I mean, what are the risks of doing that? Does it make it you know, this sort of? So that was the struggle. Now, the way I to, to see my mission, mission, of the organization, the movement, is in moving things down this spectrum, so that we move the debate and the policies over here, right? 
so that basically now the major debates that go on, although the whole marijuana thing is changing things now, but the major debates have typically been about different drug war tactics. Do we do a drug court thing or do we enhance criminal penalties? Do we criminalize that? That's been the major focus. And occasionally you get the ping pong of do we want to keep prohibition or legalize everything, right? The sort of, that's the way the debate used to be. Prohibition or legalize everything, which of course was a debate that was very interesting but couldn't go anywhere because the political system is not going to legalize drugs apart from maybe marijuana, right? So that was, a, that, you know, that, so we want to move the debate there with the serious debates down here and we also want to move the policy. Now what down here means is that I basically think there is no question that the optimal drug control policy in terms of reducing the harms of drugs and the harms of uh, the drug control policies lies over here. It lies someplace between the free market model and what I might call the harm reduction prohibitionist model. For those of you who don't know the phrase harm reduction, harm reduction is a, think of harm reduction as the intersection of public health and human rights. Think of harm reduction as needle exchange, when people engage in risky activities, but you want to keep them from spreading AIDS. Think of harm reduction as motorcycle helmets and bicycle helmets and safety belts and you know, designated driving norms. Uh, th I mean, think of harm reduction as any pragmatic policy to reduce the harms of risk of an inherently risky or dangerous activity. Right? So, the ha so think about the European policy taking a step further into a progressive, thoughtful, but still essentially prohibitionist policy where we're still maintaining the criminalization of the basic markets, right? But, but nobody's going to jail for possessing a drug. Addiction really is treated as a health issue. Nobody's going to prison for 10 or 20 or 30 years, right? If you sell drugs to other adults, you know, you're going, you're, you know, I mean, it's that kind of rationally. That someplace between here and here, right, is the right answer. That's the struggle. It's to move the locus of the debate and the policies into this terrain. I will know that I have succeeded in most of my mission, when I succeed in keeping, and I keep saying I, but I mean the we, the movement, my allies, right, in keeping this movement that comes from the left, right, and center sufficiently together, not fighting over the details, until the point when this is the public debate in America and around the world that matters. And I'll know we're successful when we reach the point when all of my allies from across the political spectrum can safely take out our knives and fight with one another over the details, right? Which is, by the way, a point we're beginning to approach on marijuana, okay? So now, let me talk about the transformation that's happening. And let me break into three areas. The first one is marijuana policy, all about that. Then the second one is prisons and racism and the whole lock, lock em up system we have and that you in California have in bold letters here. And the third one is the health issue. Now, the marijuana thing, <laughs> it's amazing. I can't believe it. I couldn't believe that we won the marijuana legalization initiatives by 55, with 55% of the vote in both Colorado and Washington last year. None of us, even the advocates, saw that coming, right? I mean, it was extraordinary. I mean, the, the initiative in Colorado got more votes than Barack Obama did, right? <laughs> The initiative in Washington State got almost as many votes as he did and more than the Democrats who won the gubernatorial and attorney general's races, right? In Oregon, they had an initiative which the preamble included a clause that said that marijuana is God's gift to earth. <laughs> it had no money behind it and it got 46.5% of the vote, the same percentage that Prop 19, the marijuana legalization thing, did in California back uh, two and a half years ago, right? So something's going on. You look at the public opinion polls, Gallup was the first one out of the gate. You know, they've been asking the same question, do you support legalizing marijuana use for like 40 years? And it was down like 12%, and in the late 70s it got to 30%, in the 80s it actually dropped, and then it started to rise slowly, and by 2006 you had 36% of Americans saying legalize marijuana, which is the highest ever, and 60% opposed. 36 in favor, 60 opposed as of six years ago, seven years ago. Jump forward to last year, that 36% in favor had become 50%. The 60% had become 46%. 14 point jump in support in five or six years, 14 point decline in opposition, total 28 point swing in public opinion in five or six years. Line up those public opinion poll with the public opinion polls on support for gay marriage, for marriage equality, almost identical. In fact, marijuana grew faster from like 6 to 10, and then gay marriage jumped over, leapfrogged a bit the marijuana thing. 
right? I mean, remarkable, remarkable transition in public opinion, right? So something's happening. What's happening? People say, how did this happen? Why did it happen? I don't really know. I got theories. I got hypotheses. I think that the medical marijuana thing, you know, played a key role. I mean, I remember back in the, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, it was like, you know, McCarthyism through the drug war. I mean, it really was. It was a period of national hysteria. There was a moment in 1989, early 90, when over 50% of Americans said that drugs, illegal drugs, was the number one threat to America. A year later, it was 6%. And essentially, nothing in the reality had changed. Just the public hype had changed, right? But I mean, but in that period in the mid-90s, when we started to do some public opinion polling, and what we found was that there were a couple of issues where the public said the drug war has gone too far. And the first one was on this issue of using marijuana for medicine, right? And, you know, that was significant. And some local activists got together in San Francisco, drafted an initiative, right? You know, they, I got a call, raised the money. I'm happy Anna Boyce, who was one of the leaders of that campaign, is sitting right over here. I haven't seen her in many years. You know, and basically, we, we put that initiative on the ballot, and it won in 1996 with 56% of the vote. Got more votes in California than Bill Clinton did when he won California overwhelmingly that year. Now, why was that important? Part of it was it transformed the public image of who was a marijuana consumer, right? I mean, I remember the, for the years before that, I would be out there as a Princeton professor. You'd get William Buckley and Milton Friedman, the famous conservatives. You'd get Ira Glass from the ACLU. You'd get Joe McNamara, the police chief of San Jose. You'd get Kurt Schmoke, the uh, you know, Rhodes Scholar, chief prosecutor, now mayor of Baltimore. And we'd be talking about why we need to consider legalizing marijuana, rolling back the drug war. And what would Newsweek do? Think they showed our photographs? Are you kidding? They pulled out some photo from the 1970s of some, you know, you know, uh, you know, 17-year-old high school dropout with like blonde dreadlocks with hemp leaves in his hair with a, you know, dye-dye T-shirt, right? You know, that was the face of marijuana legalization. Even today, by the way, is still a problem. Well, I go on any television show. And 50% of the time I'm talking, they're showing people lighting up, lighting up, lighting up, as if, as if it's all about pro-marijuana rather than ending the criminalization of marijuana, right? But the fact of the matter was, we shifted the imagery. It became people like Anna Boyce. It became people who were actually, I'm a patient. I'm using this for my MS. I'm using this for chemo. I'm using this for AIDS wasting syndrome. I'm using it for these things. It allowed thereafter, when we then went from California the next few years and legalized medical marijuana in, in Alaska, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, uh, 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 Maine, and uh, which state am I forgetting? Uh, Alaska, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, Maine, and uh, I'm missing one. No, no, no. Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Oregon. We legalized in those seven states, and then legislatures began talking about this stuff. And then you began to get patients and doctors testifying about the medical benefits, telling their real stories. And what you found was, in fact, people, you know, I mean, cold-hearted right-wing right legislators, like, you know, tearing up and saying, we got to do something here. So that made a difference, I think. And then when the dispensary started open, not so much in LA. <laughs> Because here what you had was a failure to locally regulate. Here you had, as in the state of Montana, the state government of Montana, the local government of Los Angeles, not bothering to go, oh yeah, part of our job as people who are in charge are supposed to regulate this stuff. So things got out of control. And what happened in LA actually, you know, actually got in the way of progress around the country. But then you look in Northern California, where the cities did regulate, and the other states. And then you see the emergence of dispensaries that are being well regulated, and people bringing what was below ground above ground. And you know what? The sky didn't fall. And you know what? They started to pay taxes. And you know what? Then the state of Colorado put forward a model that was, you know, they'd already legalized in 2000, but they really started to go a few years ago. They made it allowed to be for profit. They set up a medical marijuana law enforcement division, employed former drug enforcement cops to supervise the regulation of this industry with law enforcement going to visit the grow rooms, the dispensaries, and all of this sort of stuff, and paying taxes locally and statewide, right? So what happened is that, I think, enable people to get more comfortable with this. And then what happened? Well, you know, the entertainment media, I mean, it shifted. You know, I mean, it, it, part of it was, and I think, you know, we legalized medical marijuana, and then following years, every single sitcom, every drama and comedy show had to have a medical marijuana episode. And one movie after another, Susan Sarandon won't do a movie without smoking weed. Right? I mean, it just, it just became, and you know, it wasn't Cheech and Chong. 
I mean, sure, Cheech and Chong, you know, you know, gave birth to Harold and Kumar, but I mean, what happened was an evolution in the depiction in the modern entertainment media of this. And in a way, it was a little like the evolution with, 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 with gay people in this country, right? It was basically, it goes from being the flamboyant gay character to like just another character, right? And the marijuana goes from being Cheech and Chong to just a little background scene. It's not even barely part of the storyline anymore. It becomes normalized. And it's not glorifying and it's not demonizing. It's got the whole spectrum of depictions. It's the reality as we would show alcohol in America today. Right? So something changes about this. And, and you know, I'll keep analogizing not all of drug reform, but marijuana reform to the gay rights movement. Because I really see the gay rights movement as our big brother. Right? They're a few years ahead of us on this stuff. They have more political legitimacy. In the public opinion polls, they're a bit ahead of us, but on the marijuana piece. But if you think about it, with a broader evolution, 50 years ago, everybody in America knew a homosexual. They just didn't know they knew a homosexual. <laughs> right? And therefore, their image of who was a homosexual was oftentimes what they saw on TV or somebody getting arrested for what they did in a men's room or that very, you know, some scene out of Greenwich Village, Christopher Street, or the flamboyant, dramatic, you know, scandal. Now, of course, everybody in America knows a homosexual. They know a gay person. It may be their sibling. It may be their boss or their employee, their friend, what have you. And it's all become, and it's, the result has been to delegitimize the notion of discriminating against them, of being, right? I mean, that, and how has that happened? In part, because people having the guts to come out, right? Come out and self-identify, both famous people and not so famous people, and saying, you cannot discriminate against me because of who I am, right? Now, in a way, that's what's happened with illegal drugs, too. I mean, it used to be the case for that people, everybody in America knew a marijuana consumer 40, 50 years ago. They just didn't know they knew. And therefore, the image was who was getting in trouble, or the high school dropout, or the, or the, or the you know, whatever, right? Now, of course, almost everybody knows. And oftentimes, they know people who do it casually, and they're relaxed about it. And it doesn't quite seem right that you would arrest them. It even most people don't even think that's right to lock people up anymore, right? You've had that similar kind of evolution. Now, mind you, it hasn't been fully about the coming out piece. Because there's a, you know, coming out as a gay person may be so traumatic in your family and personal life, but not quite as traumatic in your legal life, right? I mean, ultimately, you had to be caught in the act before you know, they, they, changed, they changed the law and this sort of stuff, right? With marijuana, you don't have to be caught in the act. You just got to be caught in possession, right? Just got to have it in your pocket, in your car, or anything like that. You're much more vulnerable. And with drug testing, there was no sex testing to determine if you're a homosexual. I mean, God forbid, right? But there is drug testing to determine if, you know. Now, some people re react against my analogizing these two things, right? But ultimately, I mean, the truth is, for millions of Americans around marijuana, their relationship to marijuana is a highly intimate, intimate relationship. I mean, I sometimes think it is a bit like one's sexuality. And God knows there are millions of people, you give them a choice between not smoking weed for a month or not having sex for a month, I'll tell you, they're going to pick the weed. They're going to say, I'll give up sex for a month so I can smoke my weed. Right? That's true. And you know what else? I sometimes understand the gun folks that way. The whole gun thing is about freedom. But there's also, I think, almost this intimate, sensual dimension of the gun, the feel, the whole thing. You know, I'm from New York. I don't relate. But I, I, you know, I, I get this piece of it. And there's something about the marijuana, the joint, the smoke, that's very powerful, very intimate. right? And the sense of still not being able to come out, but medicalization allowed some coming out. It allowed people to step out and say, and to do that. And you want to know something really interesting in the public opinion polls about support for legalizing marijuana? As you would imagine, the more recently somebody has smoked marijuana, the more likely they are to support legalizing marijuana, right? So if you're somebody who smoked the last six months, you're highly likely, unless you're one of those growers in Mendocino or Humboldt who don't want to want to protect your business while it's illegal, right? But the, 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 uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, um, the medicalization, what it did was allow this, oh, the, on the public opinion poll, it turns out that if you ask people, do they know somebody who smoked marijuana, and does that connect with their supporting legalization, it turns out not really. Because if you ask somebody, if you know somebody who smokes marijuana, the first person who oftentimes comes to mind is a stoner. It's somebody who's got a problem with it, somebody who's too <laughs> conspicuous with it. But, get this, if you, 
people who say that they know somebody who smokes marijuana medicinally are the most likely of all to support broader legalization. Interesting. Knowing somebody who uses marijuana for what they believe to be medicinal reasons, right, is the most likely predictor of that. So that element. Now, of course, there's something else. The fact that we've now had three presidents in a row who have in one way or another consumed marijuana. I mean, the first one said he smoked but didn't inhale. The second one admitted it, so somebody added him. The third one, when asked if he had inhaled, said, yeah, and wasn't that the point? And many times. <laughs> and now we find out he actually was somebody who was bogarting the joint all the time when he was you know, in high school in Hawaii, right? So that element is part of it, right? And then it's been true for decades that half of all, America, half of all high school students have tried marijuana. But you know, now we're talking about a generation of high school students for whom half their parents have smoked marijuana, right? <laughs> That means a different conversation. Now, there's not always a conversation. Because as we know, one of the fundamental core definitions of parenthood is hypocrisy, right? <laughs> and, and, and so therefore, you know, I mean, I don't know how many stories, because I hear all these stories. I mean, how many stories are, you know, you go to, you go to somebody's house, right? And what you know is, you know, you know there's, the, there's the kids, you know, the teenagers smoking a joint with a wet towel at the door, right? You know, and there's the parents smoking a joint with a wet towel at the door, and never the twain shall meet, right? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is there's a lot more honest discussion and dialogue going on as well. And for parents of my generation, most of us are a lot more worried when our teenagers or 20-somethings are going out with a party where it's going to be alcohol than we are marijuana. So there's something going on. And what that means is, and so here's where it goes politically, it, the latest polls after Gallup, you get now this Pew poll, which really was big a couple of weeks ago. And that's, you know, they tend to be a little more conservative-minded, the phraseology of the questions, and they find not only do you now have over 50% of Americans in favor of legalizing marijuana, more or less like alcohol, they interestingly find, and this, I don't know if this is right, that actually the gap between states in the, in the coasts in the north and the south has narrowed. There's always been a gender gap with men more in favor than women. You know, I mean, I, we can get into that at some point, but what that's about, right? But what you see is, interestingly, in that poll and other state polls, even half or more of the people who oppose legalizing marijuana think that the federal government should get out of the way of the states if they want to do it. And a poll I just saw in Oregon, 80% of the public believes that the legalization of marijuana is inevitable. Now, when you start to believe that something's inevitable, whether it's gay marriage or legalizing marijuana, even if you're opposed to it, you begin to accommodate yourself to that idea and to think, how do we make this work and do it in the most responsible way? So that's where this thing is moving right now. That's where this thing is moving. The polling's popping up in different states. I was in Oregon yesterday. And there the question is, do we go 2014 or 2016? The conventional wisdom is go 2016, presidential election, more young people show up, don't go for 2014. It's one of the reasons why Prop 19 lost two years ago in California, right? But maybe something pops. Maybe something different's going to happen. So we're looking at similar states that legalized medical marijuana in the late 90s. So we're looking at you know, Alaska, Nevada, and Oregon, and Maine. Maybe it's Massachusetts. Maybe a sort of red state or purple state like Missouri or Arizona could pop out. Because we see even there, people want the tax revenue. People want police to focus on real crime. Those are the two winning arguments in, in the final stretch. People don't like the Mexican gangsters getting all the money. People, 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 whatever. It's, we're moving in that direction. The key is to be smart and strategic about this. Part of building a movement is a movement includes the, top, the professionals who are in this for the money, and it includes the activists for whom ultimately this isn't about winning, it's about the struggle, right? And bringing all that stuff together, not always easy, right? But the key is to get the best possible initiative on the ballots. What we did in Colorado and Washington was public opinion poll and poll and poll and do serious, smart campaigns trying to stay, stay on message and trying to get as many of the allies at the table as possible. When we come back in California in 2016 and there's consensus to go in 2016, if we get enough money, right, it's going to be a tight, smart, well-researched thing. We know we got work to do. Reaching out to the soccer moms and Latinos, the ones who have been lagging behind a bit. Reaching out in Orange County, only 43% voted for legalizing marijuana two and a half years ago. So we need to move this forward, but the momentum is with us. The generational shift, right? Basically, over half of all Americans, well over half of people in the age of 50, support it. Over 65, 
still problematic. What does responsible marijuana policy mean? I think we go right back to that thing. We've got to minimize the harms of the drug and minimize the harms of government policies. All I'm saying to the medical and public health people, get involved now. Stop playing the resistant, the opponent, right? And get in so we can have a responsible marijuana policy. I'm concerned now because I see in my meetings more and more people are coming from the growing marijuana industry. And some of them care about the broader principles. Some of them are just in it for the money, right? I am not fighting for the Marlboroization or Budweiserization of marijuana. Give me my choice. I want the microbrewery or vineyard model of marijuana. But is it possible to legislate such a thing into existence in America? I don't know. I don't know. What are the feds going to do right now? Right? They got a tough one. <laughs> I mean, it is all illegal under federal law. And President Obama and Attorney General Holder cannot tell your US attorneys, do not enforce federal law. Bush got in trouble for trying to do something like that in another area. What they can say is, it's not a Justice Department priority. They can provide some guidelines for prioritizing. That's what can happen now. What we're hoping with Washington and Colorado is that the feds, and they can't figure out what to do here. Right? What we're hoping is that they will give a qualified green, yellow light to say, if it's legal under state law, and you're, 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 you're doing a responsible way, and it's not, kids aren't getting hurt, no criminal involvement, no violence, well, we don't need to. Now, interestingly, the feds, and even Obama personally, has said about, about marijuana legalization and the, and the outlets, Big is bad. Big is bad. That's why they went after Harborside, Steve D'Angelo, the big medical marijuana thing in Oakland, right? Big is bad. I actually wonder if that might be a good thing that they're doing that. Because, you know, the interesting thing is the state regulatory authorities and the most successful business people in the marijuana industry have a mutual industry in doing big. A small number of outlets that are big, making a lot of money, easy to regulate. I think, though, from a public health perspective and from a broader kind of economic, you know, keeping jobs and all this sort of stuff going, and in terms of diversity and, you know, kind of small is beautiful philosophy, there's something about the federal resistance to big that may play into the hands of those of us who would like to see marijuana remain in a microbrewery, vineyard-type model. Not sure yet, but all this stuff is playing out. What happens if the feds say, can't do it? Well, then we come back in some of these states, and instead of doing a responsible alcohol regulatory model for marijuana legalization, then what we do is we do what people did at the end of alcohol prohibition, which is repeal the statewide prohibition on marijuana, don't put in place a regulatory structure, and then say to the feds, you want to enforce it, go right ahead. When, you know, the feds just don't have that many cops when it comes right down to it. They can just pick out a few people and make examples of people. That's not the responsible approach. I mean, even when the libertarians get enticed by that possibility, you know, get rid of the prohibition, don't tax and regulate, and then you look what happened in Montana, and you look what happens when there's no regulation, and people start taking, you know, taking advantage, and you lose public support. We don't want to go backwards. And I'll tell you something else. Marijuana is not going to legalize itself. Those people who think, just a matter of time, Generational shift, we got it. Look in the late 70s, where people thought it was happening. Jimmy Carter introduced a federal decriminalization bill, 11 states decriminalized marijuana. I remember smoking openly, like in you know, Harvard Square and you know, in front of Memorial. I mean, you know, well, more liberal than we have today, in a way, open. Right? And you know what happened? Parents got freaked out. About 10% of all high school seniors waking and baking. Right? Ronald Reagan, the conservative backlash, all that. And in 1979, 51% of college freshmen supported legalizing marijuana. 51% in 1979. By 1989, it was down to 16%. Young people can flip. Young people can go conservative and reactionary on us. I've seen it happen. Do not take this for granted. Learning from the mistakes of my predecessors. Not to take victory for granted. Not to assume it's in the bag just because we have majority sentiment. Not to forget that we need to have the most responsible approach for dealing with adolescents and young people. It's why Drug Policy Alliance, my colleague Marsha Rosenbaum was sitting here, led an effort, safety first, partner with the California PTA about what it means to keep your eye on keeping kids safe. When people say to me, 
What's your message about teenagers and drugs? I said, I'll tell you my message. My message is, don't do drugs. My second message is, don't do drugs. My third message is, well, if you do do drugs, there's some things I want you to know. Because my bottom line as your parent who loves you to death ultimately is not did you or didn't you. My bottom line is you're going to come home safely at the end of the night and grow up and make me healthy grandkids. That's my bottom line. And that message resonates. That this is about public health and public safety and the protection of our kids. And that the risks to our kids are not just about marijuana and what that might lead to. It's about them getting an arrest record. It's about 750,000 people being arrested each year on marijuana charges. It's about all the ways in which people's lives are screwed up by that stupid little marijuana arrest, right? That's the message. So we're not there. And keep in mind, we had 60% public support for legalizing medical marijuana in 1997. And 16 years later, Congress still won't touch the issue. They won't legalize federally. So there's a lot of resistance in that system. But on the other hand, this legalization thing is moving fast, fast, fast. And the potential for major tax revenue and taking this thing out is big, big, big. It can happen, but it's going to be complicated. And it's going to be tough. And we've got to be disciplined and realize what it is we're doing. Now, does all of this mean we're going to slide into the legalization of other drugs? Well, for better or worse, there is no slippery slope toward broader drug legalization. How do I know? Because even as public support went up for legalizing marijuana, it's more or less stayed at the 10 to 15% on legalizing the rest of the drugs. How do I know? The Dutch legalized the retail sale of marijuana back in the late 70s, early 80s, quasi-legalized, but they don't support legalizing all the rest of drugs. So there is no slippery slope. It means what are we going to do with those other substances? What is the answer? Well, I think when I look at what's part two of our agenda, part two of our agenda is end, part one is ending the criminalization of marijuana and responsibly regulating it. Part two is ending the criminalization of drug possession. For shorthand, I'll call it the Portugal model. Some of you may have heard of this in Portugal 12 years ago. Passed a law. Nobody even knew about it at the time. Basically said, nobody gets arrested for possessing a small amount of drugs, of any drug, for your own use. Right? Secondly, nobody gets drug tested with an eye to locking you up or punishing you if you don't give them a clean urines. And part three, a serious commitment to treating addiction as a health issue without the criminal justice system involved. Those three elements, ending criminalization, ending punitive drug testing, and a serious commitment to addiction health issue. So a couple of years ago, evaluation. Cato did an evaluation, found it was positive, but then a couple of academics, Alex Stevens, Caitlin Hughes, British Journal of Criminology two years ago, 10-year evaluation. What do they find? That Portugal's policy, ending the criminalization of drug possession, did not result in an increase in the number of drug users. It didn't really result in much of a decrease either. It stayed fairly constant, up in some groups, down in others. But the notion that if you decriminalize drug possession, you have a jump, not true. And there were other research. Uh, Peter Reuter and Rob McCune, a book called Drug War Heresies, found the same thing. The decriminalization of possession does not lead to an increase in the number of users. What did they find? Drug arrests went down. Drug-related criminality went down. Overdose fatalities went down. Right? HIV and Hep C infections went down. Resources got shifted to the health side. It, the most hard, the difficult drug issue of all to deal with, which is the intersection of drug addiction and mental, and mental illness, got to be dealt with in its own right. Portugal has had what are called dissuasion committees of people with health experts and social welfare experts to deal with this stuff. You know? So that is a model. How we put that model into place in America, I don't know the answer. Right? I was very encouraged by a poll in Washington, D.C. we did a couple weeks ago, which found overwhelming support for legalizing marijuana. And it also found 54% saying, we agree people should not go to jail for simple drug possession. In America, all the polling shows that people believe that if you're addicted and you get picked up for drug possession, don't send them to jail the first time or the second time. Send them to treatment. But if you don't get clean, then we got to punish you. Now, it's a little bizarre in a way. And I think the folks at the National Institute on Drug Abuse and other places have a real quandary about this.
because they're out there arguing that drug addiction is a disease. And then they're arguing on behalf of drug courts. So they therefore are arguing and basically saying, we think drug addiction is a disease. And when you manifest the symptoms of this disease by relapsing to using drugs that are destructive for you, we'll lock you up. What other medical condition do we lock people up for for manifesting the symptoms of a disease? I mean, especially one that does no harm to another human being. I mean, people have a sexual thing, maybe that's it, but I mean, that's got affecting other people, right? So, I mean, that notion, so that notion in America, that profound belief that the only way people put a drug addiction behind them is by putting, by a judge forcing them over the head to, to do it, you know, I, that, that's an American way, the belief that you need to punish people to be good. But everything we know says this is not the right way to deal with this thing. So putting forward that, now in California, Sacramento, we got a bill going with the ACLU yesterday trying to reduce the penalty for, marijuana, for drug possession from a felony to a misdemeanor, just trying to get it down, right? You know, Jerry Brown wants to deal with these federal court orders on prison population. Stop locking up people for drug possession. It'd be a great place to start, right? So that's a second piece to it. Then there's a third piece, and this is the one where, I mean, basically it's this idea. For those people who are so determined to use or buy cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, you name it, that they are willing to pay inflated black market prices and go to the black market, I say better to allow them to get it from a legal source, a government licensed legal source. Doesn't mean we've got to be selling it in stores and marketing and advertising like alcohol and cigarettes, but allow those people to come to a government outlet and get it. The heavy users, the addicts, allow them to get it, maybe even others as well. Figure out, figure out the way. You know, it's interesting what they did in Europe, beginning with Switzerland 20 years ago, and then the Dutch and the Germans and then the, the British and the Canadians a little bit, Spanish a little bit, now the Danes, is they said to the most committed heroin addicts, the people who have been addicted to heroin for years, been in jail, may, most of them got HIV, most of them have Hep C, may have HIV, they're struggling, they're burnt out, but they can't imagine living without their lady love heroin. And what they said is, you, okay, come to this clinic, you can get heroin three times a day. You can take as much as you want. And it's either going to be free or government health insurance pays or maybe we charge you a few bucks a day. And we'll give you a baseline methadone maintenance. We'll give you drug treatment. We'll try to get you housing. We're going to how to get you, help get your life together, try to get beyond the heroin. They did this. And the results now published in all the top medical journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, show that that heroin maintenance projects succeeded in reducing drug-related crime, arrests, HIV, hep C, overdose, improving people's health, well-being, all of that, and was a net fiscal savings to the taxpayer because the cost of the program was more than paid for by the reduction in criminal justice and health care costs, right? The Danes, two years ago, finally said, you know, we're not even going to do a research study anymore. The evidence is in. And there's no evidence, they said, that the Danes are so much different than the Swiss, the Germans, the Dutch, or the English, that we need another study. And why spend the money on a study? And they even said, you know, actually, we have another problem. When all the studies show that the people who are in heroin maintenance do better by every criteria than the control groups that did not get the heroin, how do we ethically now construct a control group now that the evidence is conclusive? Now, tragically, in America, we can't even talk about it. When I talk to scientists, they say, please do this here. And they say, either, Ethan, all the interesting questions have been answered, or are you crazy? There's no way I'm going to get a black mark on my name and endanger my funding for other research projects by doing a controversial area like this, right? The European scientists come to America and are told not to talk about this issue, right? We do have a political censorship of science in this area, right? There is an element, right? There's a lot of good research going on at night and brain research, all this other sort of stuff, but there's an element of researching the more social science elements of this stuff that in America, drug treatment research resembles somewhat like trying to do honest social science research in the old Soviet Union, right? You know, you begin to realize there's certain questions the government doesn't want to have asked and certain answers they don't want to hear, right? Even it may make things better, right? And you know that if you keep pressing with these inconvenient questions and inconvenient answers, well, then your next proposals are going to be sent to some reviewers who don't like you.
or don't agree with your approach. And you're less likely to be invited to serve on one of those prestigious government committees. You know, and you won't be invited to those conferences. And you won't, and when you come up for your tenure review, well, yeah. That's what's going on. That is what's going on. You know, we see the politicization of research in the areas of environment or reproductive rights when Bush administration was doing it, but we close our eyes and ignore it when it's happening in this area because it's become so matter-of-fact and conventional. But the fact of the matter is that has to be where we're going. If you ask the question, how should we be dealing with opiate addiction in America, with heroin and other things, my answer is, how do you think we should deal with pain in America? What's proper pain treatment and pain management? Right? Somebody you love is in serious pain, right? And the doctor comes to you, and the doctor says, well, listen, would you prefer I give your child or your partner or your wife, whatever, would you prefer I give them uh, morphine or Dilaudid or Demerol or codeine or oxycodone, oxycodone? They say, doctor, I don't care. Give whatever's going to work to help take away the pain and keep their basic functioning. The doctor says, well, do you want me to give it to them in the form of injection or orally or a patient-controlled you know, analgesic uh, you know, uh, or, 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 a, or a transdermal patch or a lollipop? I mean, what, what do you want me to do? They say, doctor, I don't care. What's going to work best? Now, why isn't that the question when dealing with heroin addiction, opiate addiction, right? Last year, last year, more people died of an opiate overdose than died of an auto accident in America. Right? And are we dealing with that as a nation, that epidemic? I don't think so. But that basic idea that's what's going to work. Methadone works the bestest for the mostest. But in England, 10% of the methadone get an injectable form. Right? In some parts are doing oral heroin or oral morphine. And now you have these six or seven countries that are doing, allowing people to smoke or inject heroin as part of a project. Right? I mean, what? There's a bottom line. And the bottom line is about protecting people's health and well-being. That's the bottom line. You know, I sometimes think about what happened in America where we let a quarter million or so Americans die unnecessarily of HIV AIDS because we would not allow clean needle programs of the sort that the Dutch and the Australians, even Margaret Thatcher's England, adopted just instantly in the mid-1980s, right? I think of how long it took people to come around to supporting this and the fact that even the Republican-dominated House of Representatives still won't allow federal funding for needle exchange, right? Eventually, people come around. I look at the black leadership that opposed needle exchange in the 80s and then came around in the 90s when they saw this happening. Well, there is a price to a slow learning curve. The price in America of the slow learning curve on harm reduction and needle exchange was maybe a quarter million dead, and not just the junkies, excuse the phrase, but their children, their lovers, and the ones who came into contact with it. The question we have to ask now is where do we now have a slow learning curve? Where do we say, oh, well, yeah, I'm for needle change, but heroin maintenance? Experimenting with other forms of stimulant maintenance? Trying this, trying that, trying whatever might work? But that's what's not happening. It's being held back. It's being held back, being held back. So that, I think, when I look at, and this is not just for the U.S. You know, I'm deeply involved in the stuff in Latin America. You've got Latin American presidents now saying, break the taboo, open up the debate. But what it means is down the road, taking marijuana out of the criminal justice system, ending the criminalization of drug possession, and figuring out the most responsible ways to take people out of the black market into a legal market without putting out drugs there like we have alcohol and cigarettes today. Those are going to be the three elements of the drug policy reform agenda for many years to come in this country and elsewhere. Because ultimately what we are fighting for are drug policies grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. It's about the notions of individual freedom, individual responsibility, and compassion for those who suffer as a result of that. That's what this struggle is about. This movement is poised in 2013, where the gay rights movement was in the 1980s, and the, the civil rights movement was in the 1960s, and the women's rights movement was in the, in, the, in, the, in the 1950s, I would say, and even the movement to abolish slavery and the slave trade was in the 1850s, right? More and more, the elites, the thinking people, the scientists are with us, whereas people's fears and ignorance stands in the way, right? The, the economic arguments on our side but the powerful vested economic interests on the other side. Our opponents play to people's fears about their women and their children as they do with all these issues, and we know the policies we are advocating for are the ones that most protect our women and our children and other vulnerable members of our society. 
In every one of those cases, other nations moved ahead of us, and we lagged behind. But now, even as the United States remains the global champion of the war on drugs, when it comes to the reform of marijuana laws, we, at the level of civil society, public opinion, and state government, have become the international leader. I spent 20 years traveling abroad and apologizing for my government's policies. I still apologize for my government's policies, but now I can stand up proudly and say, we, America, are the national leaders when it comes to the innovative end to cannabis to marijuana prohibition in this country. I don't know if we can lead in the other areas. I don't know if we can leapfrog what the Europeans are doing, but that's what we have to aspire and try to do. Thank you very much.